Welcome everybody to the first teachingamericanhistory.org Saturday webinar of 2019. These webinars are sponsored by the Ashbrook Center at Ashland University. TAH.org is the leading online resource for the documents-based study of American history, government, and civics for teachers, students, and citizens. I am Chris Burkett, Associate Professor of uh, Political Science uh, here at Ashland University. Um, the theme of our webinar continuing into this, this year is Great American Debates. And if you happen to be joining us for the first time, the purpose of these webinars is to pull, pull together some interesting scholars and thinkers and hopefully have a lively debate uh, to help us think through these, uh, these questions. And also, I encourage all of you joining us to join in that conversation and join in this debate by submitting questions or thoughts in the chat box. We'll keep an eye on that as we, as we proceed, and we will try to get to as many of those questions as possible. In the next week, you'll receive a, an email with a link by which you can request a certificate for a participation for today's webinar. And that email will also include a link to the archived audio and video from our conversation today. So uh, as, as always, with as everything that we do uh, in Ashbrook, we begin and base our conversations on um, documents, original documents, and we have recommended some documents that are included in uh, one of the readers that Ashbrook has, has produced recently, and uh, we are continuing to produce uh, these uh, collections of documents. And of course, those are all available on the TAH.org website as well. Our debate today is secessionists versus unionists, and I'm very happy to introduce uh, two very thoughtful uh, scholars and friends uh, to help us think about this. Scott Yenner of Boise State University and Jonathan White of Christopher Newport University. So thanks to both of you for joining us. Thanks for having us. It's great to see you both. Um, so we'll start, I won't go all the way back to the flood, but I thought maybe Maybe we'll start with a broad question, and of course, uh, here's my standard disclaimer. I throw this out every time. If I ask a question, you are perfectly free to ignore that and talk about whatever else you want to talk about. But maybe we can talk a little bit about um, how does this, how does this, what is the split? How do we think about the split between secessionists and unionists, and how did this split begin? So where do these, where does this, where does this disagreement arise from, in either? American political discourse or, or our history stretching perhaps back to the founding or perhaps even beyond. Either of you want to sort of introduce us to this way of thinking or talk about anything else you're interested in, please go right ahead. Sure. Well, I'll go first. I would take it all the way back to the founding era. And you actually, you see that in the Mississippi statement for their causes of secession, they take it all the way back to the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. And that document had banned slavery from the territory known as the Northwest at the time. Now it's the area we know as the Midwest. States like Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, uh, Michigan, that sort of area. But you begin to see Southerners threatening secession as early as 1790. In 1790, under the first federal Congress, a number of, of Quakers petitioned Congress to free to abolish the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, and slavery in the states. And this could not be ignored because Ben Franklin was one of the signers of one of those petitions of Quakers from Philadelphia. And Congress had a very, very uh, big debate over what to do about these petitions. And ultimately, James Madison, as Speaker of the House, sort of led the response to it. And they tabled the petitions and essentially they, they passed a resolution that said, from our perspective as Congress, whenever something like this comes in, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna deal with it, we're gonna table it. And slavery is a matter to be decided by the states. And so if a state wants to have slavery, then they can pass laws that regulate it and that protect it. And if a state doesn't wanna have slavery, then they can choose not to, but Congress will not interfere with slavery where it exists. And that, that sort of interpretation of the Constitution goes back to the very first Federal Congress in 1790 and then carries through. And it's interesting, as I was rereading the Republican National uh, Platform from 1860, they, they accept that view that the states can regulate slavery. And if a Southern state wants to have slavery, then they can, and, and Congress can't get rid of it. 
But from the very beginning of the nation, you have Southerners threatening, threatening secession over the slavery issue. And then it happens again with the Missouri Compromise in 1819, 1820. It happens again in the aftermath of the Mexican War with the Compromise of 1850. And then, of course, things get really heated up in the 1850s until ultimately the South chooses to secede in 1860 and 1861. So, John, John, can I just oh, prepare? Can, can, I, can I go? Please Chris? go ahead, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I can see why this will be a fr- I can see why this will be a fruitful debate here. Um, so I would like to separate some things that I think John John collapses. Um, so let's define some terms. Uh, the what is secessionism? Uh, secessionism is the idea that a state can leave the union on its own free will without the consent of other states. And there's another issue, and I'm gonna put it, I'm gonna label that state power issue. And that is, what is the proper division of power between the national and the state governments? And I think if we separate these two issues out, we would see that the issue of state power is coeval with the Constitution itself and is one of the reasons that the Constitution arises. Now, the marginal figure, so so there will be debates over whether the states can do this, the national government can do that. There'll be questions of who should regulate slave uh, trade. There'll be questions of should the national government exercise its power over the international slave trade. Um, There'll be questions of whether or not states and interfere with national government regulating the slave trade. Those questions are born with the Constitution and give rise to the Constitution. On the other hand, the issue of secession is whether a state can, of its own free will, leave the Union without the consent of the other states. And I would say that that issue does not, I mean, there may have been marginal figures who embraced uh, the idea of secession, but that that issue becomes a, a genuine uh, uh, it, it holds parts, significant parts of national opinion only around the 1830s. And, um, and they, uh, I mean, Lincoln says that uh, beginning in the 1830s, this, some began an insidious debauching of the public mind with the idea that secession was a constitutional right. And he called it rebellion sugarcoated. And, um, and so anyways, I would separate those two questions that, in my view, Jonathan kind of collapsed in his uh, discussion of when, when, it, when it arises. But is, is the question of secession, though, the, if the question is, does a, right, does a state have the right to secede, is that rolled up in the question of states' rights? Or you're suggesting, Scott, that's somehow separate. So I'm just trying to get some clarification here. Well, are you saying? I, I, I studiously avoided the term states' rights. Yeah, I know. That's why I threw it out there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because uh, I, 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 my view is that the, the, the compact theory that one of our uh, Conrad Graf, uh, one of our uh, attendees here asked about, is connected with the idea that states have rights under the Constitution. And I think the Constitution really reflects the idea that states have powers, not rights. And, and so the state's rights and secession do go together, but that's a whole different view of what the Constitution is as opposed, it's not a union, it's a compact. And, uh, and yeah. yeah, we're getting some background noise from somebody, but yeah, so I didn't mean to keep going, Scott, if you're not done, or John, jump in, please feel free. But it seems like we're, it seems like uh, when we discuss I mean, when it comes to the question of states' rights, or to put use your term, Scott, state state powers, right? The question of powers of the states. That debate, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, takes place sort of within the parameters of the written constitution. So when you want to ask questions about what state powers are, you look to Article One, Section Nine and Ten, or something like that, and the you know Ninth and Tenth Amendments. But when it comes to the question of the right, when it comes to questions of leaving the union or being part of the union it seems like you turn the debates anyway turn more to questions about the nature of the union and as you were saying the nature of the compact and in a sense it becomes sort of extra constitutional that's not the right right term but it, it turns more to the question of how the union came to be 
and what was the agreement or understanding of whoever the parties to that compact are. Right. From, well, from the Southern perspective, I think they would not, they would disagree with your character, characterization of it as being extra constitutional. I think they would make the case that it was, it's embedded in the theory behind the Constitution. If you have a more nationalist perspective, say John Marshall or Hamilton, then yeah, you would see it as extra constitutional or Lincolnian, you would see it as extra constitutional. Yeah. Yeah, because I was thinking of, you know, for speeches by Daniel Webster. I'm thinking of the lincoln hain debates, for example. And the webster hain debate, yeah. The webster -Hain, yeah, webster hain debates. And, uh, and you, can, you can clearly see those two points of view, I think, laid out from how they approach the question of first nullification and then secession. But um, just a very quick, quick sorry, interjection. Michaela, would you please make sure everybody other than the three of us is muted? Uh, we're getting some background noise from uh, some people. Um, I've been scrolling through to try to see. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so, uh, Nick, we got your question about the d distinction between the Republican Party of 1860 and today. Maybe we'll hold off on that question. That's an interesting question. I think we'll get into that at some point. Jonathan, somebody wants clarification uh, in your opening comments. Were you referring to things like the Virginia, or the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions? Do those things play a role in the development of these ideas? Well, the so the 1790 debate in Congress predates the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions by about eight years. So you had a, there's a whole if you're interested in this debate, there's a whole chapter on it in Joseph J. Ellis's Founding Brothers, and it's it's a chapter on this very early debate over secession and slavery in the first federal Congress and how Congress should deal with the slavery issue. So you had these Southern congressmen from Georgia and South Carolina talking about leaving the Union in 1790, and that's well before uh, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. Those documents arise in response to the uh, sedition, Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798, and the Jeffersonian Republicans saw those laws as unconstitutional. And so the Kentucky and Virginia legislatures had Jefferson and Madison sort of ghost write, secretly write these resolutions in response to those laws. And in Jefferson's resolutions for Kentucky, he advocated for an idea known as nullification. And the idea there was that if the federal government exceeded its authority as delegated in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, passed a law that violated the text of the Constitution, then the state could step in and nullify it and essentially do judicial review from a, a state perspective. Madison in the Virginia resolutions had a slightly different argument and his was for an idea known as interposition. And from Madison's perspective, the state could step in to actively protect the liberties of the state citizens against encroachments by the federal government. Right. Those ideas become the foundation for Calhoun in the 1830s advocating for nullification and then secession. So I think, I do think there is a, a connection between the principles of 1798 and the South Carolina nullification in the 1830s and then secession in 1860. Although secession is a different remedy, nullification and interposition are ways that the states would see themselves as staying within the union, but stopping right. the federal government from violating the rights of states citizens, whereas secession is a different kind of remedy that takes you out of the union. But either one is rooted in the idea of a compact theory of, of the government that the states created this government together and can withdraw from it if their rights are being violated. Okay. You just answered my question I was going to ask them because it seems like nullification is a question of state power or the relationship of state power to national power, whereas secession, again, is a, is a question of Again, the nature of the compact or the nature of the union or however you want to phrase it. Again, I'm sorry if I'm speaking from the <laughs> from the uh, unionist point of view on this, but uh, um, but that helps. The, that maybe helps the maybe we should maybe we should talk a little bit about what that what what you what you're saying. Yeah, yeah please. And that is uh, in that. Uh, so I, I try to define the, the terms as I understand them before. Let's talk about what it means to be a unionist, and maybe maybe I can use my definition to. Uh, then to go after what John John just said. Um, so what what is a unionist? A unionist is someone who believes that the government was created by the people, not the states, and uh, and then divided the power between the national government 
and the states based on the question, what would best serve the public interest? So, um, uh, boy, I can hear Councilman rolling over right now, Scott. All right, I know. And, um, um, uh, uh, yes, no, and, and this is an anti-Calhoun thing, obviously. So, uh, so if if the people created the government, then it's a question of how the people have divided the powers between the governments, and uh, and I think this is how Madison and Jefferson understood the union, even as they wrote the Kentucky-Virginia resolutions, because they make claims claims that the states can nullify the law, that the, the laws should be nullified, that the states can nullify them uh, based on the idea that, uh, that uh, the, the states are going to use their representatives to go back to Congress and get the laws reversed, or the states are not going to comply with the orders that the government has given. They use the words nullify. They use the words interposition, like Calhoun would later use them, but they mean those words to be, I'm going to say, within a unionist understanding, whereas Calhoun uses the same words and puts them within a state compact theory understanding. And therefore, the states have rights, and they have rights to, to re, uh, prevent national laws from operating within their states. And so th th I, I would say there's, this is my this is my critique of Jonathan General uh, on this point generally. That is, uh, there's a superficial continuity, but there's a real discontinuity. The superficialness of it is that they're using many of the same words between the Kentucky Virginia resolutions, Calhoun and 1860 Southerners, but they mean different things because the constitutional theory underlying them is different. So that's, a, by the way, it's a good response to the follow-up Conrad submitted about whether secession was based on what they called compact theory, that is being a state, a state could secede because it joined the compact, right? But yeah. what, you're, what you're pointing out is, and I think this John, this is where John started too, is there seem to be two different understandings of what the compact are from the very, very beginning that manifest themselves even in the first Congress in 1790. Is that a fair, I mean, is that... Is that a fair statement? There seem to be. Well, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to defer to Jonathan on the historical question, uh, and by that I only mean I, I don't think that the that state governments or many representatives were acting on the basis of a compact theory before 1830. And um, you mean and, from the secessionist point of view? Yeah, from the secessionist. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm going to have to hold that thought for a moment. I'm pulling up my my. Uh, copy of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions and giving it a quick look to see what, what Jeff I, Jefferson talks about the 10th Amendment as being the most important part of the Constitution for him. Um, but I wanted to see if he, if he, if he does talk about compact in 1798. So here's Jefferson in, um, on November 10th, 1798, in the first uh, Kentucky resolution. He says, um, the, res the residuary mass of right to their own self-government and that whensoever the general government, so he's talking about the states there, assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and no force, that to this compact each state is seated as a state and is an integral party, that this government created by this compact was not made the exclusive or final judge to the, of the extent of the powers delegated to itself, since that would have made its discretion and not the Constitution the measure of its powers, but that, as in all other cases of compact among parties having no common judge, each party has an equal right to judge for itself, as well as infractions as the mode of measures of redress. So I, I, I may well, have misheard you, but I, I do think Jefferson is rooting his argument in the compact theory there, and then Marshall, John Marshall will respond and McCullough versus Maryland and other nationalists will respond and argue against that. But from my reading of Jefferson is he's really rooting it in that theory of compact. So Jeff, so by the way, that, that passage that you quoted, John, I mean, that, I think Calhoun actually quotes that passage in his, mm -hmm. uh, is it in the disquisition on government? And then, and of course, that seems to be his understanding of the nature of the compact, Calhoun's. And of course, Calhoun then builds onto that, I think, 
with ideas like the concurrent majority and others mm -hmm. things that I don't see in Jefferson. But I just wanted to mention, by the way, Jefferson Jefferson does something similar in his um, um, opinion on the National Bank, if I'm not mistaken, in 1792-1793, right? 1791. 1791, he begins his opposition to that by saying, I believe the Constitution rests on um, the idea that certain powers are reserved to the states. I'm not sure if he uses the language of compact there, but this certainly does seem to be a Jeffersonian idea to a certain extent of the nature of the compact or the nature of the, what the party, who the parties are and how this is supposed to work. Right. I don't think that's James Madison's understanding. I think Madison has a slightly different understanding, which might also have been reflected in the differences between the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions as well. But um, because I want to go back to something Scott said, Scott, Scott, you were defining, you were defining a unionist, right? Uh, and you said the unionists believe that the Constitution is founded on the consent of the people. Is that right? Is that how you were defining this? Yeah, people and not the states. Oh, oh people and not, not the states. states. So that that to me again sounds like the argument that's, that, that's the explicit of the argument of somebody like Daniel Webster, uh, for example, right? And I'm I think Madis, James Madison would tend to and he'd be inclined to tend to agree with you. But well, it, can Madison, I just interject very quickly? Madison please. in in the Virginia Resolution uses almost identical language to Jefferson. Is that right? Talking about, talking about the, he says uh, that it views the powers of the federal government as resulting from the compact to which the states are parties as limited by the plain sense and intention of the instrument constituting that compact. And he goes on to elaborate on that. So in 1798, I think Madison is very similar uh, to Jefferson. Now, Scott makes a good point about a distinction between um, 1798 and 1833. And Madison did that as well. There's a very famous letter that Madison wrote to Edward Everett in the 1830s, where Madison looks at Calhoun and says, no, 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 that's not what we meant in 1798. I'm not sure there's as much of a difference between 1798 and 1833 as Scott sees, but it's Madisonian to say there's a difference there. Yeah, because it seems like Madison... So, yeah. Madison I mean, go ahead, Scott, please. Yeah, I, I, it, the, the issue here is that, I mean, it, it's complicated. So let's just, let's, let's go back and think about it. It's not like the states aren't part of the Constitution. And it's not like the way the Constitution was ratified ignores the states. Each state had to ratify. And so the states are, and this is what Madison says, and this is what Jefferson says. I should say, this is especially what Madison says. Let me, I'll go like that. The states are parties to the compact. That is, that the, the people were organized into states when they ratified the Constitution. But I think the biggest, you know, theoretical problem with the idea that the Constitution is a compact of states is that it didn't require unanimity of the states to ratify the Constitution. It was nine out of 13 states, which means that there was a supermajority of the states that are required to ratify the Constitution, but not unanimity. And that means they're acting as a people, not as states. So the states are parties to the compact. No one denies that. But the states are uh, nevertheless uh, parties to a compact that the people themselves end up consenting to. And I, I think Madison is yeah. really, you know, like he, Madison is really, uh, when you look at him early, and when you look at him late, uh, he adopts my idea of unionism. Uh, and I think he uses irresponsible language from his own point of view um, in the 1798 uh, uh, Virginia resolutions, uh, suggesting that the state's uh, are parties to the compact, which is like, I think, technically true, but in the context gives people the idea that, uh, that it might be a state compact. And uh, I'm just looking at Federalist 45, where he has this famous diatribe against the idea that states have rights. And I'm not gonna, not gonna read it, but uh, any, any participant who's interested in the idea that the founders um, uh, embraced the idea of states' rights really should look at the first paragraph the only time James Madison uses exclamation marks, uh, I thought it was 45. Uh, he's as passionate here as he ever was as a lover. Um, and, uh, and so, 
take your word for that. <laughs> <laughs> I've read his letters. Trust me. Okay, gotcha. Okay, but but you know, but on this on this point now, so I do get the sense that Madison, he uses certain language, but this is in 1798 in the context of the crisis regarding the uh, the, the the acts, right, the Alien mm-hmm. and Sedition Acts, and then I do see. You know, I can think of four or five letters where Madison, by the late 1820s into the 1830s, is writing to maybe correct those views. And he does write where, he, again, as John, I think, pointed out, Calhoun's got it wrong. These others have it wrong. And it's almost as though Madison is trying to clarify or correct what he, that, as you put it, Scott, that irresponsible language that he may have used earlier. Um, my, but my, in almost all of those articulations by Madison of the nature of the compact. He does seem to say, I think, Scott, of course, here's the thing with Madison. He's trying to write his understanding of the nature of the compact in these later letters. And it's not a simple, it's never clear exactly what he's saying. He's got these long convoluted definite or explanations of how this works. But my sense is, at least my interpretation, Scott, is close to what yours is. That is, Madison seems to think that yes, the states played a role in this, but it's not the states qua states that are the parties, right? If that were true, then it would have been state legislatures ratifying the Constitution. But it's almost as though, and again, this might be pushing it too far, but building on something you said, Scott, the states are more are kind of like ratification districts, right? In a certain sense. So it's the people, whole people of the United States that ratify, but on a state-by-state state basis. And Madison seems to think that drastically alters uh, the nature of the union or defines the nature of the union in such a way that secessionists like Calhoun can't make the claim that a state can simply, you know, by the vote of a state legislature at least, uh, secede from the union. But but I'm thinking of, I'm sorry I'm talking so much here, but I'm thinking even even going into the constitutional... We we need to go, let's... Let's go back and get to the 1860s yeah. in there, Chris. Oh, go ahead. Because it wasn't, it wasn't the state legislatures that uh, seceded, right? They they established their own secession conventions, didn't they? They did, yeah. Correct. And so they were trying to mirror the the actions of the ratification process uh, with, with a kind of extraction process. And so I think, you know, they acted consistently with the idea of compact theory and what we're debating here is whether or not the idea of compact theory is a genuine reflection of anything that existed uh, at national statesmanship levels before 1830. Right. And I should clarify, I, I am not an adherent to the compact theory of the Union. I just think that it was a, a widely, or if not a widely held, at least a view held by several very prominent people in the 1790s. Yeah, it does seem to become more and more prominent. Uh, yeah, I mean, Lincoln, to be... Lincoln refers in a different speech, and I think this is kind of implicit in his first inaugural. Uh, to it, uh, and this is from his July 4th speech, and of course, I'm not going to find it right when I need to, uh, that he gives in 1861 after he's president. He talks about an insidious debauching of the public mind that began 30 years ago. And, uh, and he, he says that good law-abiding citizens in the South couldn't have been b- brought to rebel against the government. So statesmen started to, I'm going to say, stir up the people or educate them toward the idea that there was a compact theory and that a lo- it was law-abiding to secede from the Union, that the Constitution supported the idea that, the, that, that states had a right to secede from the Union. And... <clears throat> And so his his view, and you know, I think this is, uh, and, and maybe Jonathan and I are agreeing on this, is that, that that idea did not really exist in statesmen, that is, in prominent people who who shaped the public mind, until 1830. That helps answer one of the questions that one of our uh, attendees has asked. I mean, there was the Hartford Convention of 1815, where right. Northerners did contemplate the idea of secession. And the, the important thing about that is that it brought shame, public shame on those who were associated with it and killed off the remnants of the Federalist Party that, that seemed to be backing it. So that these things mm. existed is one thing, and, but that they were considered marginal and, and objects of derision and shame when you held them is the important thing, I think, to reveal what the acceptable limits of public debate and the public understanding of the Constitution were. Now I'm talking too much. 
<laughs> well, no, I did, but I wonder, Scott, if that if that sense of shame at, at the idea of secession, if that uh, it, that seemed to become dishonorable, certainly in the North or at least in New England, because again, by you know by the time you have Daniel Webster arguing with Hayne, Senator Hayne, uh, Senator Hayne, he's speaking on behalf of what he calls all New England men, for example, right? <laughs> Believe that to be true. But I, again, I'm not sure. I don't think the 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 shame that attended the supporters of the Hartford Convention carried over to the states. And maybe the maybe this is worth bringing up. Maybe the reason for that is maybe correct me if I'm wrong on this. I don't know that the Hartford Convention had anything to do with the issue of slavery, or did it? Well, it had to do with Southern power in the national government, okay. which is then connected to slavery. But I would all I would. I, I don't disagree with anything that was said, but I would also add to the mix that the Hartford Convention is happening at a time when America is at war, that the Federalist Party opposes voting for supplies for the troops when the nation is at war, and that that was also a very big part of why the Federalist Party died. I mean, if you think about John Kerry in 2004, when he said, I actually voted for the $87 billion before I voted against it. I mean, if there's a lesson of the Federalists in the 18 teens, it's that you never vote against supplies for the troops. It's political suicide. Uh, okay. And so I think that was a, an equal, equally important part of why the party disappeared by the end of that decade. That's great. So I do want to get to, Scott took us to 1860, uh, into the 1860s and Lincoln, and I do want to come back to where uh, you guys were, were going with that. But we've had a couple of Good questions come in, and by the way, just let me mention: if you're sending, a, if you're submitting a question, make sure you submit it to all participants uh, instead of me privately, so that uh, John and Scott can see them. Do you mind if a couple of follow-up questions to some of these? So, Scott addressed the Hartford Convention, and John, um, there was another one in here. Uh, this goes back to Madison's take on the Constitution um, and his arguments regarding the Union in 1798. From Ray, was Madison's take in 1798? The partisan spin, sort of in support of Jefferson's prospects in 1800. I don't know if any of either of you want to deal with that or have a sense of that. I'll defer to Scott. I mean, my I have a. I actually wrote my first first paper in graduate school on this question. If you, you remember that? <laughs> I do remember it. It was 1993, and uh, and and uh, and the title of the paper was "The Two Faces of Madison." And uh, and my my argument was that Madison uh, was a, a strong unionist um, in, until 1791, and became a strong unionist again when he left the presidency, and that his his own prospects for election in Virginia were really compromised by his uh, strong unionist understanding of the Constitution. So he began to trim those uh, that understanding in the way he presented himself in public uh, at that point. So uh, Ray's question is is a good one, but I would say that it's not so much or not only Jefferson's prospects in 1800, but also Jeff, uh, Madison's pro own prospects in Virginia that required uh, a qualification on his Union understanding of the Constitution. Um, my chief, I mean, I, I think I, you can you can show that he changes the way he uses language and all that stuff. Um, but he he really wanted to be a senator, and he was denied the Senate piece uh, when the Constitution was founded and ratified. And he learned and internalized that lesson, and never got too far outside of Virginia opinion. Yeah, Patrick Henry got him on that, I believe, right? Um, Yes. Yeah. He prevented him from running. He put did he put Monroe up against him uh, for the Senate, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we've had before maybe before we circle back to the the sort of post 1830 views, uh, or maybe maybe this will lead to that discussion, and then we can get to the the, the the deeper divides that emerged by the 1850s. We've had a couple of questions submitted that touch on the issue of slavery. So we've been talking about the sort of intellectual, that's not the right word, but the, uh, the divide between unionist and secessionist views from the idea of the social, the nature of the union or the compact or the constitution. Let's maybe dig down a little bit and talk about the role that slavery played in this. So Christina, um, Dustin submitted a question and Christina submitted a question having to do with the decisions of Congress uh, regarding slavery 
Um, her question is, if it was determined early that it was to be a state decision, slave or not, then why did Congress keep making decisions regarding it? Um, and of course, Congress's role in this was not simply restrained to, but was largely uh, in, the, uh, in the determination of whether territories would have slavery or not. So we talk about how did slavery really, to what extent did the question of slavery really influence these two views, the unionist view and the secessionist view? Well, in response to the, the first question about if if it was going to be left to the states, why was why were so many laws passed? Am I understanding that question correctly? Yeah, can you see it? I'm, it's, I'm not sure if you can find it. If it was determined early that it was to be a state decision to be slave or not, then why did Congress keep making decisions regarding it? Yeah, so most of the laws that Congress made related to slavery had to do with either one banning the, the transatlantic slave trade, which the Constitution allowed Congress to do as of 1808. So in 1808 and 1819 and 1820 and other, at other times, they passed laws to try to suppress the transatlantic slave trade. So that's within con Congress's purview. Another part of the laws that Congress passed had to do with fugitive slaves. And again, the Constitution has a fugitive slave clause. And so when Congress was passing laws in 1793 and then again in 1850, those laws are connected to a very specific provision of the Constitution. But then the rest of the laws have to do with the territories. And so Article 4 of the Constitution gives Congress the power to legislate for the federal territories. And up until 1857, with the Dred Scott decision, everyone is arguing about should slavery expand as the nation expands can it go into the territories and so the laws that congress is enacting have to do with the territories and not the states in that regard so so the, the, the as you mentioned the central question i think the the, the big question the most heated question uh between 1820 and the 1850s is the question of the expansion of slavery right right again pretty much agreed upon by everybody with maybe some notable exceptions uh, in people like William Lloyd Garrison and others, but pretty much everybody agreed if the state wants slavery and has slavery, there's really not much Congress can do about it, except perhaps in those ways regarding fugitive slaves, as you were pointing out. But when it comes to the expansion of slavery, and Congress, as you were saying, has uh, on numerous occasions exercised it, what it believed to be its constitutional authority to prohibit slavery in certain territories or allow it in others, is that... Is, the, is there a correlation between those things and the, uh, uh, I have to be careful how I say this because I don't even know if this is true. Do, do the cries for secession or the arguments for secession increase and become more vehement and adamant in any kind of parallel, with any kind of parallel to the uh, agitations with regard to the question of regulation of slavery or prohibition of slavery in the territories? Yeah, I mean, I think they do, especially by the time you get to the late 1840s and the early 1850s, when the debate is going on in Congress over the Compromise of 1850, you have Southern members of Congress who are openly arguing for secession. Robert Toombs, who's a congressman from Georgia in 1849, gives a speech that says, if you try to hem us in and not allow us to expand into the territory we picked up from New Mexico, or from Mexico, that that will mean secession and civil war. And so by, it, it certainly becomes more, um, a, a much louder debate by the late 1840s. And it's all connected to that issue of expansion of slavery. But again, I'm surprised. Again, I'm sorry I'm talking so much, but you're you're both raising questions in my mind. I'm I'm amazed at how it seems anyway. Whenever there's a major crisis, whether it's um, early 1790s, as you were saying, John, or um, 1820, uh, tar the tariff crisis, this particular instance you're you're mentioning in the aftermath of the uh, Mexican War, there's already clearly embedded in, in, is it fair to say, the Southern mind, the idea that the or threats of secession are valid and are used as sort of political tools to get, um, to prevent the, the passage of certain things or to protect the interests of the South. 
it seems clear that, that, that they've just simply accepted the idea that secession is a constitutionally uh, legitimate thing to do because they are, it seems like they're constantly using that as a threat in a certain way. Um, so, so, so let's, can, let, let, can I weigh in on that or I want to, I want to elaborate on that, Chris, cause that's, that's a good point. Um, so the, the way I look at that is something like this, that is after the 1830s, the Southerners thought they could only protect slavery within the union long-term if the union was looser. And, uh, and they what do, you, what do you mean looser? Sorry. By, by looser, I mean that uh, the, the states would, would continue to be able to operate on their own. Oh, I see. Without, okay. Without the national government imposing any kind of view on them. I see. And, uh, and, and part of being looser is that the territories would be freed from national control, other parts of being, you know. So they're inconsistent in their advocacy of this, but nevertheless, this is what they put forward. And, and Calhoun was a mastermind. I mean, Calhoun was a genius, the great political genius of the first half of the uh, 1800s. And he remade the Democratic Party toward the view of compact theory. The Southerners slowly took over committees in Congress. They legislated toward that vision. They slowly took over the federal judiciary after having taken over the Senate Judiciary Committee. And it became a test of party loyalty to become a member of the federal judiciary um, to believe in the compact theory. So that by 1857, the, the fruits of Calhoun's labor to remake the Democratic Party and to remake the Constitution in light of the compact theory were becoming, were, were, well, he, the, the fruits were being born, if that, that's, that's what you say, but they had successfully remade the, the, uh, the political culture um, in, in you know, like the establishment uh, to, uh, toward this view. And it's that view, of course, that Lincoln is rising up against and that the Republican Party is rising up against. And you can see it in that platform that you guys um, have made part of the, the, the readings for this, that they're really trying to combat that theory and the policies that uh, gave rise to it. So, I mean, you can, uh, you know, so this is Lincoln's view, and I think it's borne out by a lot of historical research um, as, as to how the Southerners were protecting slavery through remaking the Constitution in the compact theory. And, um, and Dred Scott, as I say, is when the project is nearing completion. But, yeah, I want to pick up on that at some point because I think that's important. That's a really great point, Scott. So, but can I just ask a follow-up question? So, so the so the certain states, southern states in particular, are are threatening secession on various occasions to protect their interests that are directly connected to or even indirectly arising from slavery. Is um, to what extent are, are they bluffing? You say they want to loosen the union, but do they? Do we have a sense, Scott or John, of whether or not they were really sincere? And did they want to loosen? Did they really think that actual dissolution would take place? Do we have any way of gauging this? Well, it ultimately happened. So. Okay, true. <laughs> That's true. So, but I, but I do think that there are stages of bluffing in this. Um, uh, you know. Uh, Part of me wants to go back and like disagree with Lincoln and his assessment of uh, American history, and that it's the first great Southern victory was the Missouri Compromise, where they genuinely did make threats, um, uh, and the North gave in and allowed slavery to expand into Missouri, into Arkansas. Um, these things were not well supported by. Um, you know, but by the North, but the, the North blinked and showed that they would give in. And that, that moment of weakness uh, to allow slavery to expand, even to places where it was, um, that, that I'll, I'll say pattern happens then after the 1830s with increasing frequency. And uh, what began as a bluff, when, when more and more people believe in secession becomes something you can act on. So uh, that, that, that uh, I, I think it starts maybe a little before 1830s. That's that's my critique of uh, of, of Lincoln in that. But uh, but nevertheless, it uh, 
it uh, bears fruit later on, as Jonathan just said. I think that's a really good point. And again, I, as you're describing uh, it, it, the 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 language or the, the threatening language, if you will, um, of secession takes on a certain importance and a certain color after the 1830s, as you're saying. But uh, just as an aside, I'm reminded that in a certain sense, even if you go to the Constitutional Convention, you find delegates uh, from South Carolina and uh, Georgia in particular, and occasionally North Carolina, bluffing. Well, I don't want to say bluffing, but there's a question of whether they're serious or not. They're not talking about secession, but they are they are repeatedly making the argument that North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia will not even join the Union unless there are certain protections for slavery. So it's not exactly the same, obviously, as what you're describing, Scott, but that there is a kind of history there of, of that kind of uh, sort of confrontation. So, and I was also going to ask quickly, so what you were describing, Scott, and how Calhoun remade the Democratic Party, is that the debauching of the public mind, do you think, that Lincoln is talking about or, or some aspect of it? Yes. Um, he's referring to? You know, yeah, I, I think it is. Uh, and, uh, I mean, it, it, when, you, when you date it back, it's to 1830. And, you know, Calhoun is the one who orchestrated the Mexican-American War. Uh, this is something that, uh, especially many of us who are very interested in American history, is something that I, I just am only starting to add up correctly together, I think. But James Polk ran for president in, what, 1844 on the platform 5440 or fight, that it was, it was all about the expansion to the Northwest. And within nine months, he was at war with Mexico. And that's a very interesting fact. Um, and and Calhoun is really the mastermind. He appointed Calhoun Secretary of State, and Calhoun said, well, maybe not 5440 or fight. Um, let's expand in the other direction. And, uh, and that was done explicitly for Southern interests to uh, expand slavery in that direction uh, with the hopes of expanding it in that direction. And, and that is another like, moment. That's another point gained for that, uh, for that view, the slave pro-slavery uh, compact view uh, in the Democratic Party. Very interesting. So we've got um, uh, Scott or John, one of you mentioned earlier the Dred Scott decision, um, and John brought up 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and I kind of want to build up to those things. Uh, one of you described this as sort of the pieces of, the, of something falling into place through these various uh, important moments. Because ultimately, I want to ask the question, look, it seems like the pieces are falling into place with 1850, maybe, and then 1854, and Dred Scott in 1858. They seem to be falling in place in favor of the, of the interest in slavery, which one would think would lead to a decline in calls for secession. Um, but I want to kind of build up to that, if you don't mind. And somebody submitted a question, uh, let's see if I can find it, on uh, the Compromise of 1850. Um, Dustin, to what extent did the Dustin asked to what extent did the Compromise of 1850 support a more unionist perspective, given that it was supported by Henry Clay, and to what extent did using popular sovereignty as an element seek to appease Southern states and even future presidents, such as Pierce, that viewed abolitionists as agitators of the slavery question? So, John, I don't know if you had any particular thoughts on that, because um, I know you've. Yeah, so I would say this, so. that it supports a unionist perspective, but not necessarily a northern perspective. Interesting. Do so, I, do I, do I, you know, Henry Clay has this bill that he wants to get through. Ultimately, he fails in getting it through, and it's Stephen Douglas who breaks it into five pieces and gets it through. But the, the whole purpose of it is to avoid a, dis, a dismemberment of the union. And so it is a unionist measure. It, it gives something to all parts of the country. At the same time, a lot of Northerners are livid about it because they think it gives too much to the South. And Daniel Webster is seen as a traitor to his part of the country because he supports it. The Compromise of 1850 had a, a Fugitive Slave Act with teeth. And there's a very poignant political cartoon that shows Daniel Webster asleep at his desk in the US Senate as a Southerner is sneaking up behind him and slipping into his pocket this Fugitive Slave Act. And so Northerners look at it and see it as 
as treason to their cause. And I remember when I was in graduate school, I edited a diary of a man named Sidney George Fisher. And it's a really wonderful diary. And I did the Civil War years of it. But in 1850, as the compromise was being debated, I remember this passage he wrote where he predicted, he said, war still will come, whether it's in a year or five years or 10 years, he didn't know. But he knew that this was only going to be a temporary sort of stopgap measure that would preserve the Union for so long, but it, it wouldn't be permanent. You're talking about the 1850 compromise? 1850 compromise, no. yeah. Despite the, cons from a certain point of view, concessions to the slave interest, uh, uh, it's still just a matter of time. Right. right. Wow, that's very interesting. Because when you take that and then you take 1854, right, with the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which essentially opens the territories up, from Lincoln's perspective anyway, it completely opens the territories up to slavery, right? Mm -hmm. Without restriction by Congress. Well, the Kansas-Nebraska Act? Kansas-Nebraska Act, yeah. Yeah, it, it opens up the territories of Kansas and Nebraska, so the upper portion of the Louisiana Purchase, to uh, popular sovereignty. And actually, the, the Compromise of 1850 had opened up New Mexico and Utah to popular sovereignty. So that mm. theory had been put into federal law regarding those territories in 1850. Stephen Douglas then takes that and applies it to Kansas and Nebraska, repealing the Missouri Compromise. Um, yeah. So it's not necessarily a settled question that they'll become slave states, right. but the people who move there can decide, the white people who move there can decide. Yeah, and because it removes Congress from the equation. If I right. Remember. Right. So and then the Dred Scott decision comes three years later and says you can't even have popular sovereignty. It's just that yeah. these areas are open to slavery now. Right. So Joe, I think it's Joe uh, asked the question that I'm I'm building toward, and Joe asked it very nicely. So ultimately, why does popular sovereignty fail? <laughs> so his actual question is: at the time, is war the only available option? Uh, why does why does popular sovereignty fail? as an alternative to secession, uh, the secession versus union divide. So because 1854, you would think would be a great um, uh, uh, sort of palliative, in a sense, right, to people who have been calling, uh, arguing for secession as the only alternative to protect. Right. But on the flip side, 1854 brings people like Lincoln back into politics. I mean, Lincoln had gotten yeah. more engrossed with his law practice prior between, between 1849 and 1853. And then the Kansas-Nebraska Act sort of brings him out of just focusing on the law and, and getting back into politics. So it, while maybe it would, yeah, Southerners wanted the Kansas-Nebraska Act and it should have made them happier, but then it, it agitates Northerners in a way that I don't think, well, you know, I do think they saw coming. Stephen Douglas, when he was discussing so the whole reason Douglas wanted this law was he wanted to have a railroad that would go from Chicago out to San Francisco so that they can bring in gold. That'd be great for his home state. Yeah. And Douglas is meeting with Southerners and they say to him, we will not support you getting this railroad unless you repeal the Missouri Compromise. And you have to do that and you have to open up this territory to slavery through popular sovereignty. And Douglas says to one of these Kentuckians, a guy named Archibald Dixon, he says, by God, sir, I'll do it, but it'll cause a hell of a storm. <laughs> so I think Douglas yeah. knew this was going to cause problems and it leads to the destruction of the Whig party and the birth of the Republican and other parties. Um, and right. it, it ultimately is what I think pushes the nation towards disunion. Interestingly enough, because again, as so Chris, let person, me, I, I just want to yeah. like go in on that same question. The way, the way I think just the simplest way to think of the Kansas-Nebraska Act would be something like this. Does, uh, for those who oppose it, it raises the question, um, what kind of union do we want? We have always wanted a union without slavery. And the adoption of popular sovereignty promises that we will not have a union without slavery. And, uh, and, who should be deciding what kind of future we as a people will have? Now, this is why the compact theory is so important for the Southerners, because they want to, in a way, withdraw that question from the national stage. And popular sovereignty is the means they use to do that. 
This is not a question that the national government has an opinion on or should have an opinion on. They want to withdraw. Whereas the Republicans want the people to weigh in on this question. Therefore, their policy of not of, of stopping the spread of slavery ends up being connected with the whole idea of unionism as a theory. Should the people weigh in on what kind of union we will have when it comes to slavery? That's the big question. And the Southerners and, and Northerners obviously have different interests in that, but they also end up pointing to these two different constitutional theories because uh, they want to answer that question differently. And um, <clears throat> so Lincoln comes back into politics precisely because the, that, the, the, the idea that the union should be able, the people should be able to weigh in on what kind of union we have is threatened. And that's what the Republican Party really stands for in 1860. The people should weigh in on it. Yeah, that's very that's very well put. That's very clear. So, you're both of your thought you're 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 both making you're you're leading some interesting questions and and chat submissions. I'm trying to read through some of these. Um, so, uh, Margaret asked about uh, the, the 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 right of a state to secede. As if they're part of the Confederacy, I'd like to actually build up to that toward the end because I think that's an interesting contradiction at some point. Uh, Stacy says regarding the question of why these compromises did not reduce the call for secession. Hey, Stacy, by the way, do you think uh, it's because of human nature? Humans keep asking for more. In other words, the wins for the pro-slavery uh, side led to calls for more and more expansion of slavery. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable, I think that's a, a good way to think about it. And in terms of why popular sovereignty failed, which someone had asked about, the Dred Scott decision ultimately takes it off the table and says, you can't, it, this isn't how it's going to work. Slavery can just spread into these territories. And then Southerners want more. And so by 1860, Southerners, Southern Democrats, when they go to their first and then second presidential nominating conventions in Charleston and Baltimore, they want a federal slave code for the territories. They actually want a strong federal government when it comes to protecting slavery. And Stephen Douglas is not willing to go along with that. And Stephen Douglas advocates for if, if states or territories want to pass what he calls unfriendly legislation, that they can do that to try to kill slavery over time. And so Southerners, I think to that question, they do want more and more. They want more protection. They feel more and more threatened. You certainly see that in the Mississippi Declaration of why they're seceding. And someone like Douglas, who's just, who he wants popular sovereignty, he, he says, I don't really care if slavery is moral or not. Let, let the people just decide. That's not good enough for Southerners. They want hard federal protection for, for slavery everywhere. Because it seems, again, and you mentioned this earlier uh, as well, uh, and Scott did as well, with the realignment of the parties or, and the reemergence of a Republican party that is now pretty clearly united on opposition to the expansion of slavery. Those, those uh, concessions, if you will, that the slave interests had received in 1850 and even 1854, there's no guarantee that those are permanent if you have the emergence of a super block, so to speak, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a major party, the Republican Party, that has the potential to become the majority party um, and thereby reverse perhaps some of those, those changes, which Lincoln and the Republicans pledged to do in part. Right. right? So, All you got to do is read Lincoln's speeches and other Republican speeches to see that's what they're advocating for. And then that explains yeah. why South Southerners felt so threatened. Right. So very good, very good point. And Scott, aren't, I lost my thought. You, something you raised to, um, had said, raised another question. Um, and I've lost it. I apologize. So I'm not going to waste time chasing it. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, but there are, again, a number of really good questions coming in. So um, let's see. Oh, I know what it was. Uh, comrades follow-ups here um, reminded me that it seems to me, please, either of you correct me if I'm wrong on this, um, Douglas's calls for popular sovereignty and Calhoun's sort of compact theory of the nature of the union, which included the rights of nullification and of secession, 
they were both, were they both not aimed at union saving, were they not thought of as union saving measures? It seemed to me even Calhoun made the argument that the only way to prevent the ultimate dissolution of the union was to concede the right to secede, including nullify, and to nullify, right? Am I wrong about that? Am I imagining that? It seems like Calhoun made the argument that, that and there's a kind of irony here that only if the states have a constitutional right to secede can the union in the long run be um, be preserved. I may be wrong about that, but I'll defer to Scott on that. They, they did want. I mean, they did see secession as a constitutional right, and uh, I mean, uh, you you can you can analyze for yourself whether or not you think the uh, the I the the. Uh, the only way to preserve your marriage is to make sure you divorce. You have a divorce. Um, and uh, and so I, I, if, if, whether well, that's strictly logical or uh, or not is another question. Well, I didn't I didn't make it very clear. What I, I, so you, you give me one more shot. It, it, the irony to me seems, or the contradiction may be, the same understanding of the union, the same understanding of the compact that led Calhoun and others to conclude that there must be an inherent constitutional right to secede. Um, Calhoun argued that, okay, now I'm botching it again. Calhoun argued that there must be a certain understanding of the compact in the union, and only with that understanding could the union be preserved, because it would lead to ideas like the right to nullify and the idea of the concurrent majority and others. And those things were necessary to preserve the union. But that same understanding of the compact and the, and the nature of the union also led him to conclude in the right to secession. So again, I'm, where's the, I'm not sure where the logic in that is, but there seems to be um, perhaps a contradiction in there somewhere. But uh, So Chris, um, Lance here asked a question on something that I just, uh, I had talked about. So I want to yeah. just try to clarify this. So, you know, this is this is uh, uh, the, the way I simply put uh, uh, federalism is something like this. Uh, what power? I ask these questions. What powers must the national government have? What mu- what powers must the people weigh in on? And and it's those things that are necessary for national harmony. And where acting together would be much more effective than ap- operating separately. So states can have different minimum wages, states can have different education systems, and we can still operate together as a people. Can states have different labor um, arrangements when it comes to slavery and have us still get along? Now, initially, the founder said, well, maybe, but, uh, but uh, we're not so sure, so we want to stop the spread or have the national government weigh in on whether or not slavery will spread. That's the territories question. We have to have one opinion as a people on what's going to happen in the territories. And, uh, and so uh, over time, as slavery itself becomes a cause for agitation, it's a real question whether or not we could live together as a people with different ideas on this labor question. I don't consider it only a labor. That's, it's not only a labor question. And the 13th Amendment is what eventually answers this question. We're not going to have different opinions. Uh, We can't live as one people with having different opinions on this. But states have powers where the policy area doesn't compromise national harmony. And what what ultimately uh, is the Republican position is is that slavery is disrupting national harmony and spreading it is spreading na- national disharmony. And uh, so containing it is really necessary to maintain a union. So their, their anti-slavery position ends up being really connected with the people need to weigh in on the nature of the union, and popular sovereignty becomes a threat to having a harmonious union because it allows the spread of slavery. It reminds me of, I think there's a passage in scripture about a house divided against itself. If only Lincoln had thought of that and used that in a speech, by the way. Yeah, it's a great, uh, I mean, uh, and, but, you know, but what Lincoln says after that is that we, we, we can't exist half slave or half free. We'll become all of one thing or all the other. And what Jonathan did nicely before is describe how there was policies afoot 
where we were becoming all the other, that is all slave. And the Republicans point, you know, he points to the idea that ultimately it has to be one or the other. Right, right. So we're down to our last 10 minutes or so here. And um, can, can we, t- I hate to say we've got 10 minutes to talk about Lincoln and Alexander Stevens and their particular arguments with regard to secession. Uh, either of you want to describe uh, Lincoln's argument against it or pick up Lincoln's argument against it and, uh, and maybe say something about Alexander Stevens' um, cornerstone speech where he describes the new, this kind of unified view as you were just describing, Scott, but now unique to the Confederacy. So, um, by the way, these, these, these two were friends, if I'm not mistaken, right? Kind of friends. Right. They, were... they had served together in Congress in the 1840s during Lincoln's one term. Stevens was from Georgia, Lincoln from Illinois, but they were both Whigs. And so they, they had been friends during that time, almost 15 years or so before the war began. Very interesting. Scott, do you want to take uh, it first? Yeah. I'll, 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 let's talk about the session for a second. Uh, and, and I'm looking at Lincoln's first inaugural now. I'm, I'm going to confess that I am not blown away by Lincoln's first inaugural, and um, and uh, as and, uh, and and this is maybe a heretical point of view on on mine, but I'm not going to get into that part of it just now. Um, Lincoln is not, I would say, opposed to secession in principle. Uh, he sees secession as an act of revolution, and he never denies that the people have a right to revolution. And um, the question is whether that they have just grounds for claiming revolution and or whether, as he puts it in the first inaugural, whether any clearly written constitutional right has been violated. Um, he says, if one has, that would justify revolution. If it's a vital right, even more so. But then he just he said that is not the case, that, but such is not our case. No right has been violated. Now, the implication there seems to be, I mean, that's very interesting, right? And I think Lincoln is consistent throughout his whole, um, through his whole uh, public career on this question. It's not, he's not opposed to secession necessarily in principle, but if you can secede or revolt, these two things are, I'm going to say, collapsed on his analysis. Hmm. If you can secede and revolt without grounds, you cannot have a Republican government yeah. that will function. And what Republican government needs is minorities and majorities to kind of shift and to give way to uh, the minority to give way to the majority um, on, on any, uh, any uh, issue that does not violate a clearly secured constitutional right or power. Right. And um, so uh, later on in it, uh, Lincoln has this uh, blanket statement that secession, uh, the, the essence of secession is the, or secession is the essence of, the central idea of secession is the essence of anarchy. Right. And I once pointed out in class that Mikhail Gorbachev said the same thing when Latvia was seceding from the Soviet Union. <laughs> um, and, oh. and so, <laughs> and it's true, he did. And uh, you can't uh, secede from the Soviet Union. We're a, we're a union. You're not making a moral equivalency, though. So. I'm not saying it's equivalent because what <laughs> Lincoln isn't opposed to secession in principle. It's yeah. when there is no legitimate grounds for it that it becomes the essence of anarchy. I see. So I've been Lat- Latvia had legitimate grounds. I want to be clear about that. Right. But by the way, I would, on this point, I'm, I'm again. There's he, Lincoln makes a certain argument in the first inaugural, and I know we didn't. It's not included in the reading, uh, but his message to Congress in special session. On July 4th, I think is a is a is a different kind of argument, and in a certain way, a stronger argument against secession on a, from a more constitutional perspective, uh, which takes into consideration larger questions about the nature of the union, when it was formed, is there an escape clause? It was understood that there was no sort of out clause, and so on and so forth. But we don't have that reading for today, so it's a bit unfair for me to bring it up. But um, just recognize that basically. So the, the way I look at those two speeches, uh, Chris, is that is that much of the the first inaugural is an attempt to show that that what the Southerners are doing is not consistent with the Declaration of Independence, and then the Fourth of July effort is an attempt to show that what the Southerners are doing is not consistent with the Constitution. That's a great point. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's just that's a great, great, nice way to think about those things. So. 
So, uh, wait, again. I, I want to interject one thing, and I haven't fully formulated this thought, but I, I think Lincoln sees a distinction between secession and revolution. I don't see, I don't, and I think the, the sentence that you pointed to, Scott, actually makes that point where he sees revolution. He says at one point, this country with its institutions belongs to the people who inhabit it. Whenever they shall grow weary of the existing government, they can exercise their constitutional right of amending it or their revolutionary right to dismember or overthrow it. So on the one hand, you have a right as a people to either change the form of government through the constitution or to overthrow it. On the other hand, the sentence you read, plainly the central idea of secession is the essence of anarchy. And so, whereas over, again, I haven't fully formulated this in my mind, but just what you said made me think of this. For him, secession, if it's anarchy, is the opposite of the rule of law. It's the opposite of, it's not claiming the right of revolution. It, it's, um, it's going beyond sort of the accepted, in his mind, the accepted rules of how you respond to some, to this sort of situation for him. They, they're unhappy about the outcome of an election. You, you can't just pull out of the government and secede as a result of being unhappy and uh, because of an election. And I think he uses the word anarchy to, connected to secession very purposefully because throughout this speech, he's talking about free people, government by the people, uh, the rights of the people, constitutional checks and limitations. and Anarchy is the exact opposite of those things. So anarchy is lawlessness. And if you have lawlessness, you're not really free. And so you might amend the constitution in order to secure freedom. You might revolt against a government and overthrow it in order to secure freedom. But because he calls secession anarchy, he's saying this isn't going to create a, a free society. It's actually doing the exact opposite. Yeah, I think again, there's... Yeah, I would I would agree with everything you say, except I'll just add in this case <laughs> to it. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to oversimplify too, but in the first, so there's clearly a connection between the two passages you're both referring to. I hear a little bit of Jefferson in the first part where he's talking about revolution being justified for violations of constitutional rights. A little bit when I read that when I hear the last part is that Jonathan was focusing on um, with secession leading to anarchy. Again, it's an oversimplification, but I'm, it's, I'm, I'm hearing Hamilton and his idea that governments have sort of inherent obligations uh, to, to preserve order uh, for whatever the ends of that particular government might be. But um, these have been really great thoughts, and we are at the end of our time. But I wanted to throw out two last questions to see if either of you wanted to jump on them. I, they were submitted earlier. Uh, so, so I just mentioned to build up the, to this. So... For, for 30 years plus, we have th this growing argument uh, for the right of a state to secede, um, and it seems to be it seems to be at least indirectly connected with the idea of state powers uh, as we started. And then you have the you have the state secede, you have the Confederacy formed, and by the way, Alexander Stevens' cornerstone speech. If I'm maybe I missed it, but I don't really see any emphasis on. The right of states necessarily. It's the, the emphasis of that speech is not on states' rights. It is on uh, the fact that this new confederacy is founded on a moral cornerstone, which is a rejection of the fundamental principles of the Declaration of Independence. I just find it interesting that once the act of secession takes place, it seems as though we're just going to be completely open, at least from Stephen's point of view, about what this is really about. It's really about slavery and, and uh, a justification of slavery. But it leads to another question that was submitted. After all these years of talking about the rights of states to secede, why is there no right to secede in the Confederacy itself? Any, anybody, either of you want to think about that out loud? Can a state secede from the Confederacy? Well, they several talked about it, and in a sense, West Virginia is an example of it where West Lincoln sent up a puppet government in, in Alexandria, Virginia, that then cons uh, allowed West Virginia to become its own state to secede from um, 
Virginia in 1863 and become its own um, state. So, and, and people in Mississippi were talking about trying to secede from the Confederacy. So there, there certainly was talk about it. One of the ironies for people who argue that the Civil War was about states' rights is that the Confederacy actually became far more centralized more more rapidly and more thoroughly than the union did and so while they while some southerners were talking about the rights of the states i mean the confederate government was centralizing and and saying no you can't exercise certain rights that you may want to exercise because we're at war and and we need the power in richmond that's a great point i think john i think it may have been you who told me this a while i don't know a year or two ago uh, somebody pointed out to me that one of the reasons Alexander Stevens was vice president of the Confederacy is because they needed somebody from Georgia in the government because Georgia was one of those states that was that that was very strongly opposed to this consolidation uh, that they saw taking place under the Confederacy. Yeah, uh, and the governor of Georgia became Joseph Brown became one of Jefferson Davis's chief critics, and as it. did as did Stevens. The Confederacy thought they could avoid partisanship, and so. They appointed, they were elected, Jefferson Davis to be president of Mississippi from Mississippi, and then Stevens to be vice president. Davis was a former Democrat. Stevens was a former Whig. And I think that they hoped that they could sort of have a nonpartisan nation that could overcome sort of the political problems of the, that the, the nation had seen in the 1850s. They should have known their history better, though. I mean, if you look, Jefferson Davis is named after Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton Stevens has an obvious namesake. If they had paid attention to how the original Jefferson and the original Hamilton had gotten along, they would have known that it was going to be a disaster for Davis and Stevens. <laughs> Those are great points. That's really, really interesting. So, hey, I've kept you both over a couple of minutes. We didn't get all we didn't get to all the great questions that were submitted, but I, I know your 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 time is valuable, and we really do appreciate you both joining us today and helping us think through this complicated question. And I've learned a lot from both of you, as always. So I enjoy these conversations very much. So, so thank you very much. Uh, really, really do appreciate your time. So. Great so to I'm, be not sure I'm not sure we've answered all the questions, but we've answered a lot of them, and we've left with some more good questions, which is uh, uh, an opportunity for all of us to keep thinking about these things. Um, so thanks again, both of you. It was really great. Um, thanks also to uh, people joining us for submitting such great questions. Uh, very, very well done. Let me mention, by the way, before we end, um, uh, I strongly recommend the, the works of both of these fine scholars. Um, Scott uh, Yenner, you've written, I know, extensively on the family and politics, and uh, you are the editor of a recent volume of uh, documents, right, core documents from the Ashbrook Center on Reconstruction, which is available now, I believe, um, for download uh, or in print form. You can get those through TAH.org. Um, it's a great collection. And John has written a number of books on the Civil War. Uh, your, I think your most recent is Midnight in America. Is that right? Darkness, Sleep, and Dreams during the Civil War. Is that your most recent? Uh, I've had one since then. It's a history of the USS Monitor. Wow. Okay. So I, you're, you're, you're a publishing. You're a writing machine. It's hard for me to keep up. But they're they're all great. I haven't read the most recent. Sorry. I apologize. But I'll get it now. But uh, I strongly recommend the works of both of these fine scholars. They're they're great writers and great thinkers, and I uh, always learn a lot from them. So. Uh, just a quick reminder again about the email with the link for your certificate of participation. Um, our next Saturday webinar will be Imperialists versus Non-Interventionists, and that will be February 2nd. And I'll be joined by Greg Schneider of Emporia State University and my colleague here at Ashland University, Jason Stevens. So until then, Happy New Year. Uh, look forward to seeing you in, uh, in about a month. So take care. Thanks.